both offended by Jesus. Peter momentarily, and Judas for longer. But the root of the offense is the same. We're told that the devil had already put the thought into Judas's heart to betray Jesus. And nothing Jesus could do would, would change Judas's mind or heart, including serving Judas by washing his feet. Yes, it's true. We are told Judas is among the disciples until after Jesus washes all their feet. But nothing will deter Ju Judas from his mission, even Jesus' extravagant love. He has convinced himself that he is right. He knows what needs to happen. He needs to hand Jesus over to the authorities. And Peter, although not filled with evil in the same sense, is repelled by Jesus wanting to wash his feet. You will never wash my feet, he says. He's either proud or ashamed of his own dirty humanness, or filled with the sense that what Jesus wants to do is unseemly, acting like a servant. Both of these two men have an idea that they are different in some way, set apart. Whether it's better or worse than someone else, I understand what's going on with this Jesus, or my feet are really filthy, I won't let you touch me. Their way to self-identity is to create distance. And then, when Jesus tells Peter, unless I wash you, you have no share in me, Peter swings wildly in the opposite direction. Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and head, he exclaims. If this is what Jesus must have, Peter will do it in the biggest way. Lately, I've been reading Thomas Merton's book, New Seeds of Contemplation. I was really struck by a particular passage. Merton says, people like this can only conceive of one way of becoming real, cutting themselves off from other people and building a barrier of contrast and distinction between themselves and other people. They do not know that reality is to be sought not in division, but in unity, for we are members one of another. People under the influence of this type of thinking, according to Merton, say to themselves, I have what you have not. I am what you are not. I have taken what you failed to take, and I have seized what you could never get. Therefore, you suffer and I am happy. You are deprived and I, you are despised and I am praised. You die and I live. You are nothing and I am something. And I am all the more something because you are nothing. And thus I spend my life admiring the distance between you and me. At times this even helps me to forget the other men who have what I have not and who have taken what I was too slow to take and who have seized what was beyond my reach, who are praised as I cannot be praised and who live in my death. And now I am thinking of the disease which is spiritual pride, Merton continues. There's something of this worm in the hearts of all religious people. As soon as they have done something which they know to be good in the eyes of God, they tend to take its reality to themselves and to make it their own. They tend to destroy their virtues by claiming them for themselves and clothing their own private illusion of themselves with values that belong to God. Who can escape the secret desire to create a different atmosphere, to breathe a different atmosphere from other people? Merton concludes, I must look for my identity somehow, not only in God, but in other people. I will never be able to find myself if I isolate myself from the rest of humankind as if I were a different kind of being. What Jesus is doing in erasing those distinctions that trip us up as they trip up Peter and Judas is that Jesus is acting as both host and servant. He is the one who is teacher and Lord and servant, and he asks us to act in the same way. 
when we are in danger of feeling pride or difference from others, we need to serve those others. We need to feed them. We need to offer them what we have to offer, whatever it is that they need. And we need to try to do it while not making distinctions between them and us, whether they are hateful, judging distinctions, as in, I am better than that person because I made different choices in my life, or benevolent, paternalistic distinctions, as in, that poor person needs my help. There's a true story circulating on the internet that originated in Europe about a unique opportunity to share with other people. The man says, two of us are visiting a cafe in Bulgaria. We enter a little coffee house with a friend of mine and give our order. While we're approaching our table, two people come in and they go to the counter and say, five coffees, please. Two of them for us and three suspended. They pay for their order, take the two and leave. I ask my friend, what are those suspended coffees? Wait for it and you'll see, he says. Some more people enter. Two girls ask for one coffee each, pay and go. The next order is for seven coffees and it is made by three lawyers, three for them and four suspended. While I still wonder what's the deal with those suspended coffees, I enjoy the sunny weather and beautiful view towards the square in front of the cafe. Suddenly, a man dressed in shabby clothes who looks like a beggar comes in through the door and kindly asks the person behind the counter, do you have a suspended coffee? It's simple. People pay in advance for a coffee meant for someone who cannot afford a warm beverage. The tradition with the suspended coffee started in Naples, but it is seeped all over the world. And in some places, you can order not only suspended coffee, but also a sandwich or even a whole meal. This story is something like a story that I read in today's newspaper about a sandwich chain, Panera, doing something similar. I don't know if you've read that. But it allows people to pay extra for someone who might not be able to afford a meal. I'm not quite sure why this story moves me so much. Maybe it's that People are taking the opportunity to give to people who not only can't pay them back, but who will never know their name. And the person who receives the suspended drink or food can feel cared for without feeling obligated. When we take this opportunity to give anonymously, that's really a loving action. And when we're given the opportunity to receive the love of another, it does something to us. The article says that poverty in Bulgaria, the European Union's least wealthy country, is increasingly sparking social unrest, with several desperate people recently setting themselves on fire. This small loving action is making a difference for people who are in danger of becoming more and more isolated and desperate. I give you a new commandment, Jesus says, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. We still make distinctions between people. We still justify ourselves or try harder to be saintly. But when we create those distances between other people and ourselves, we do two things. We forget that Jesus erased distinctions between himself and us by serving other people and by suffering the pains that we suffer. God has been glorified in him, the one who gave himself completely, the one who served, the one who suffered. As Merton says, in order to become myself, I must cease to be what I always thought I wanted to be. And in order to find myself, I must go out of myself, and in order to live, I have to die. Something to think about on Monday, Thursday.